So good afternoon and welcome to this webinar on drug repurposing. As you know, this is part of a series of events organized by the European Joint Program on Rare Diseases, EATRIS, um, Radboud University, Fondation Maladira, and Fondazione Intellectuale. This is the third and last webinar of the series. In the first two, we heard experts from industry and academia, as well as patient representatives, tell their stories and share their point of view. And today, we will focus on getting a repurposed drug to the patient. My name is Elena Beltrani, I'm a pharmacologist by training, and I currently am Technology Transfer Manager at Fondazione Teleton, the major charity funding research on rare genetic diseases in Italy. We have two ex vivo gene therapies that have been developed in our institutes and that are now actual drugs approved at the NIA, EMA, uh, but we also fund many scientists who work on repurposed drugs. Today, I have the honor and the pleasure to co-host this event with Christine Petro. Christine is a doctor of pharmacy and holds a master's degree in regulatory affairs. She's in charge of academic research valorization and industry partnerships at the Fondation for, Foundation for Rare Diseases, where around 35% of the academic projects they work with are on drug repurposing. So our agenda today is very rich. We will start with a description of the regulatory path to bring an orphan drug to the patient, and that's going to be presented by Liliana Gianluzzi. Then Christine will moderate a round table where three companies, namely Ophelia Pharma, Teranexus and Aptilus, will describe the challenges they faced in repurposing drugs and how they have become, they, they have overcome these obstacles. We will then learn from Professor Guillaume Cano about his successful collaboration with the industry. Before we start, just a couple of uh, practical info. So first of all, this meeting is being recorded. Um, so be aware of that. And um, you can submit your questions. There's a specific section that you find at the bottom of the page that's called Q&A. You can use it to type in your questions and we're gonna address them during the meeting and possibly afterwards if we don't manage to handle them all in the, um, in the session. What you can also do using the Q&A section is to vote a question that you would really like uh, to see answered by the participants to the section. So now, without further ado, I'll leave this virtual stage and the presentation to Viviana, who will tell us all about the regulatory pathway to bring a repurposed orphan medicine to the patient in the EU. Viviana is a doctor of pharmacy and um, she has a, a PhD in cellular biochemistry and pharmacology, and she has a degree in clinical research of medicines. She has many areas of expertise, in particular ethics and regulatory. She's an expert in preclinical and clinical research, GCP, clinical studies application, and um, she has been at the PDCO um, at the EMA. Currently, she's the coordinator of research department at Fondazione per la Ricerca Farmacologica Gianni Denzi, and she acts as project manager uh, for many projects that are funded by the EU. She's a member of the working group on rare cancer and of the European Cancer Patient Coalition. So I'm going to leave the stage to Viviana. Thank you very much, Elena, and uh, um, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Um, I will uh, show, um, okay, I am, please um, confirm you properly see my, my screen. And my yes, we do. Great, thank you. So, um, as Elena um, already mentioned, I will uh, provide you um, an overview on the, the regulatory pathway to bring a repurposed orphan medicine to the patient, focusing um, specifically um, to the European framework. First of all, let's uh, start with the definition of a drug repurposing, that is the practice of finding novel therapeutic indications for existing drugs. We might have two different scenarios. The first one is a known drug that is already um, authorized in Europe, so it has a marketing authorization. 
Often these drugs are of patent, so the patent is expired because they are, for example, hold drugs. The second scenario relates uh, to the investigational drugs. They have no marketing authorization in Europe for uh, any indication, so, so they are still in the research and development process phase. But in both cases, so even um, both in case uh, we have um, a known authorized drug, uh, where very well known, uh, used um, in clinical practice of label or in label, uh, and uh, in case of investigational drugs, we need to undertake the research and development process and to apply for um, approval from the regulatory agencies for the new indications. This is to demonstrate efficacy, safety and quality, even if, of course, for especially for very well-known drugs, we have already some data, uh, for example, coming from um, known uh, preclinical data from animals, uh, from, so from the lab or um, from the clinical practice, or even from, um, let's think about the voluntary uh, volunteers of um, the clinical uh, studies. But in any case, we need to undertake all the process to arrive to the patients in order, of course, to have a medicine that has been properly uh, studied and authorized for the use. Let's focus on the first part that is <clears throat> the research and development phase <clears throat> uh, that leads to the preparation of the package that is evaluated by the regulatory agencies. So we have <clears throat> the development of the pharmaceutical formulation. We have non-clinical data that need to demonstrate and to justify the clinical trials. And then we have the marketing authorization application. Mm, in the rare disease settings, very often we have orphan medicines. In the European Union, these medicines are designated under the regulation uh, 141, um, entry to force in 2000. Um, the orphan designation in Europe is free of charge and is a way to recognize that the medicine could receive incentives. The designation can be uh, is released under um, on the basis of the criteria of prevalence, um, of course the, uh, that relates with the rarity of the disease. And then we have the second criteria which should be complied with together with the prevalence um, criteria. That is the lack of treatments already authorized um, for the um, orphan indication. Alternatively, if we have already on the market authorized treatment for that orphan condition, then we need to demonstrate the significant benefit of this drug over the existing one. This procedure is free of charge, as I mentioned, and um, allows uh, the applicant to have um, different incentives. I would say that the main one and for companies, the market exclusivity of 10 years. Uh, additional two years are uh, granted if the medicine is intended for the pediatric use. And so the pediatric development is undertaken as well. Um, importantly, we have a free of charge assistance and advice from the um, European Medicine Agency um, for SME, for academia, and for um, uh, pediatric related um, uh, issues. And then we have um, a number of fee reduction, especially for SMEs. We have also the possibility to have public funds. These um, rely on the uh, European Commission um, availability and willingness to have uh, funds in the framework of research uh, programs, or even they could be um, given by the members, the single member state. 
So uh, we have a lot of support uh, and incentives to um, undertake the research and development of medicines intended for rare diseases. That is, um, by definition, a little bit difficult with respect to the other um, uh, development, considering, for example, the small uh, sample size and other um, difficulties that uh, are related with the development of medicines for rare diseases. If the product is also a pediatric one, as we know, the majority of rare diseases um, affect children, then we have further obligation in the uh, research and development process. In particular, we need to undertake the pediatric investigation plan that has to be agreed by the um, a pediatric committee at the European Medicine Agency, as stated by the pediatric regulation. Uh, for off patent medicines that uh, are very often uh, repurposed, we have a voluntary uh, procedure that, that is the pediatric use marketing authorization. We can have also um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the possibility to undertake the development process and to have a marketing authorization under the Directive 2183. In this case, we have no uh, PIP to be agreed by the BBCO. Um, this is a little bit, um, I would just like to provide you to different scenario and the, the legislative uh, framework for the medicines for children, just to say you that we need to have to comply with further uh, the obligations um, if the development is to be uh, carried out also in children. Just to be more uh, detailed, uh, for product unauthorized, the, the pediatric regulation uh, obliged companies to agree with APIP with the PDCO, and that should be completed at the time of marketing authorization unless a deferral or a waiver is granted. the um, results coming from the pediatric studies are negative because of course the effort has been or it has been undertaken. And we also have this obligation, even if we have a patent product, but it should be, um, it's intended for a new indication. Even in this case, we have the same incentive. For off-patent products, as I mentioned, we have, a, we have a voluntary procedure that is the pediatric use marketing authorization with grant, that grants 10 years of market exclusivity. In this case, the, the, um, the company voluntarily undertake the PIP and then get the Puma. What is the PIP? It is a plan including all study to demonstrate to demonstrate quality, efficacy, and safety. It's to be agreed with the BDCO, uh, and it's to be applied usually at the end of the phase one of the um, adult development. And then the uh, pediatric um, development starts on the basis of what has been agreed with the BDCO. Just um, a reminder, uh, of course, when dealing with children, very often we need to have specific formulation. Uh, so because we have excipient that may be toxic, toxic in children, or we need to consider that the ability to use the medicines, of course, are, um, is different between children and adults. So we need very, we need often to have a pediatric specific formulation. Another thing that complicates a little bit the um, developmental uh, pathway. Um, if we have an orphan product, uh, I mentioned that we need to have an orphan designation. It's granted by the um, Committee for Orphan Medicine. If we have a pediatric product, we need to liaise with the PDCO. If we have an advanced therapy, we need to liaise with CAT. What I would like to show you is that 
the um, regulatory pathway is um, sometimes complicated but in, and needs a lot of um, interaction with different uh, committee uh, at, and working parties at EMEA. Importantly, the uh, European Medicine Agency provides uh, a significant support because, of course, liaising with the different committees means support from the agency in order to properly undertake the research and developmental plan. Then we are here, you know, we have we undertaken our um, research and developmental plan, we have our package, then we need to apply a marketing authorization. For orphan medicine, we have the centralized procedure that is compulsory in Europe. Um, what is the centralized procedure? Is um, in the European, uh, the, the procedure um, to be applied at European Medicine Agency uh, is uh, um, uh, given uh, to a maximum of 220 days. Um, what does it mean? We have a single authorization from the EMEA that is valid in all European member states at the same time. After the marketing authorization, we, are, we have a centralized safety monitoring and we add the product information available in all European languages. Then we are here in the pricing and reimbursement. It's held at national level. Uh, it means that payers decide which product will be provided and paid by the public healthcare system or the insurance funds. The decision, of course, is based on the national pricing and reimbursement policies. The initial price is proposed by company, but the price depends on the therapeutic value and the cost efficiency of the product. Mm, sorry, just to conclude that this is the pathway. It is. It not doesn't end with the national pricing and reimbursement procedure because then we have this part. We need to uh, manufacture the product in the um, Euro uh, European member state where the pricing and reimbursement procedure um, provided uh, the, the the positive outcome. And then the, the, the drug can finally reach the patient and we can be pretty sure that our product is of quality, efficacious and safe. And then we have the safety monitoring. So we have the, um, the monitoring, the post-marketing safety monitoring. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Viviana, for this uh, really uh, nice presentation. Um, we have a couple of questions that um, uh, we received from the audience when they signed in to the webinar. Um, so the first one is um, if you can get a drug approved for a new indication, even if you don't have a pharmacological rationale, it's not possible, of course, because we need to have a rational in all cases. Uh, the repurposing is not an escape uh, to the regulatory procedure because we need to have all the steps complied with. If we have an orphan medicine, the, the pathway is more and more um, defined because we need to go to have a centralized procedure so of course it's not possible we need to um, ensure quality and efficacy and safety in all cases the path might be easier if we already have some data coming from the previous um, developments that may be useful and used for the next for the proposed indi new indication Okay, thank you very much. And um, the other question was if there are any examples of regulatory shortcuts that can be applied in the case of repurposed drugs. Every regulatory shortcut could apply to everything. We have no regulatory procedure specific for repurposing. Um, 
uh, we the, 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 if we want to um, shorten the timeline to get the, the drug approved, the European framework um, can provide us the accelerated procedure and the conditional approvals. Let's think about what happened uh, for COVID vaccines. We have uh, the implementation of uh, the accelerated and the procedure. Let's consider that both procedure that, that I mentioned are um, very often used, especially for rare diseases products or for orphan products, um, because um, it, they are um, used by the European Medicine Agency if we have um, Mm, a, a limited set of data uh, so uh, that the applicant can require the marketing authorization to the agency but then it needs it's obliged to provide further data supporting and confirming the um, benefit risk that is positive collecting data during the um, use of the medicine in the clinical practice, so when it, it has a marketing authorization on the market. So, uh, okay. thank you very much, uh, Viviana. Uh, so, I'm going to take again the control of the presentation. If you allow me to um, again thank you and introduce you to the next um, uh, part of our um, journey today. Uh, which will see the roundtable moderated by uh, Christine. And I'm going to share really quickly the slides with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Elena. Um, good afternoon or good morning and welcome to this roundtable on uh, discussion on um, drug repurposing from an industry perspective. In Europe, since 2000, as you can see from that side, uh, 2000, when the orphan drug uh, regulation was approved, 224 orphan drugs have been approved and they cover 133 rare diseases. And uh, one in five, 45 orphan drugs have been repurposed. Of course, uh, one can add to these figures uh, off-label use, or uh, drug candidates that are in uh, clinical trials. Um, but, but, but actually, you know, um, anyway, it means that there is still a, a way to go and that getting a repurposed drug to, to the patient is not a long, quiet river. Um, yet there are companies um, that are focusing on drug repurposing and you already have heard about it in the two previous workshops but today uh, this round table will give the floor to three speakers from three different pharmaceutical companies they will share their experience with with us uh, discuss challenges but also opportunities to repurpose drugs in rare diseases and uh, it is, it is my, my pleasure to welcome Hugues Bien-Aimé from Ophelia Pharma. Hugues is General Manager and Chief Scientific Officer at Ophelia Pharma. He has a PhD in chemistry and 30 years of experience in both big pharma and biotech companies. He is also the founder of Ophelia Pharma, which is a company focusing on the development and the marketing of orphan drugs uh, in children in neurology and oncology. Also with us, Julien Vess from Terranexus. Julien is Chief Business Development Officer at Terranexus. He holds a master's degree in biochemistry and uh, he has an executive MBA from HSC Business School. He has 20 years of experience in the healthcare industry and his company, Terranexus, is a biopharmaceutical company that develops drugs to address severe unmet needs uh, in brain disorders. Also with us, Terence, Terence Béguin from Apteus. Terence is the CEO and the co-founder of uh, Apteus. Uh, 
he is a PharmD by, by training and he holds a PhD in medicinal chemistry. Apteus, his company, is an innovative biotech with an indiv individualized approach of drug discovery and drug repurposing to serve rare monogenic disorders um, with high medical need. So um, thank you very much uh, to, to you all for being, being there with us today and uh, welcome. Um, the first question I, I'd like uh, to start with um, would be a very basic one. Um, how, why have you decided, why has your company decided to repurpose drugs? What's, what's your strategy? Who wants to start? Hugues? Yes, I can start. Yeah, thank you. Do, you. do you hear me well? That's okay? That's okay. Fine. So thank you very much, Christine, for the kind introduction. So my name is Hugues bien -Aimé. I'm the general manager of Ophelia Pharma. Uh, just in a nutshell, Ophelia is a, is a biopharmaceutical company, pharmaceutical company developing medicine for children, especially in um, very severe condition of children uh, in epilepsy and in oncology. Uh, we do develop uh, medicine in niche indication uh, when there is a strong uh, remaining uh, unmet medical need. Uh, the, the model of the company is actually to develop and to market and to commercialize its own medicine. So it's not simply to go to up to phase two and then up license. Uh, our model is to go through to the market and to commercialize our medicines. And we have been uh, Etablissement Pharmaceutique Exploitant, with, which is a French name for uh, exploiting the company. I don't know exactly the term in English for this, but uh, uh, so we've been Etablissement Pharmaceutique Exploitant since, since about a year and a half. Uh, the reason, uh, so actually I should say also that we have two marketed products, one of which is Kigebec, which is a formulation, a pediatric formulation of the Gebatrine for the treatment of infantile spasm, which is a very severe type of epilepsy in uh, infants, in very young children. And we do, do also have Evozal, which is a formulation of uh, clofarabine for the treatment of ALL, also in children. Both of them are, are centrally approved by the EMA in Europe. Uh, so, uh, at your question, why, why we decided to uh, repurpose drug or to address at least the uh, repurposing of, of medicine and the strategy of the company, I think it's fairly simple, the answer to this. Uh, first of all, there is uh, still large unmet need for repurposed for repurpose medicine, for medicine existing, there is still strong need to have pediatric formulation or to have indication adapted to children. That is one point. Uh, obviously, for a small company like Ophelia, there is uh, also one point, which is uh, risk mitigation, uh, because uh, when you're considering repurposing, you consider usually, not always, but usually, uh, starting from a known API or a known active medicine. So you already have some good knowledge of the tolerance of the drug. Uh, and usually you also have some hints or some data regarding the uh, activity of the medicine in the indication that you have, because eventually the drug have been used off-label in the indication that you're interested in or the situation. So you have kind of risk mitigation. It's, it's less, for me, it's less risky to, to consider, to uh, address the repurposing of medicine when you compare that to, to a more uh, conventional drug discovery process. Uh, and there's also financial reason for this because uh, you don't go through every steps of the drug discovery. You don't necessarily do all the preclinical package. Usually you will rely on the known medicine. So you will, um, you will uh, I would say, cross-link or address all the uh, preclinical package of, uh, of the medicine that is on the market, the reference product, the reference product. And so you will need uh, less capital uh, as required for, uh, uh, I would say, a new, a new medicine. Mm -hmm. And also I should point out uh, regarding Ophelia that as an organization, we are moving from relatively simple, pro uh, simple project 
Gigabec, for instance, is a pediatric formulation of a known medicine, but we have not changed the indication regarding the originator's product, which is called several, and which is also indicated in infantile spasm. So we have not changed the indication. We have simply developed the pediatric formulation. And we are moving now as things goes, uh, as time goes by, I should say, uh, we are uh, we're moving to more uh, ambitious project, slightly more risky. Uh, we have a project in, uh, in oncology, in the development of a, of a known anti-cancer medicine, but in a new indication, in a neuroblastoma, relapse or refractory neuroblastoma. And for this development, we will be relying on uh, clinical data that we're generating. Okay. So thank you, thank you, uh, so um, real drug repurposing for your second, second product, actually. Um, Julien, uh, what's your strategy uh, regarding drug repurposing? Yes, so uh, thanks a lot, Christine. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, in, in a few words uh, about Theranexus. So Theranexus is a French company that was created in 2013 by two academic researchers who previously were in the Atomic Energy Commission. And this is based on their work there that they decided to found uh, uh, Theranexus. So Theranexus currently has four drugs in the clinic, uh, and I will go back in that later. Uh, we also have uh, research platforms, and basically our key concept is to uh, target both neuron and glial cells, so non-neuronal cells in the brain that are spotting neuronal activity at the same time. And to do this, uh, we are developing drug combinations. And uh, to answer your question about uh, why we chose drug repurposing, I think that one key challenge that we have to face uh, is to, since we are developing a, a very novel uh, approach and concept and mechanism of action, uh, we have to prove this concept is right. Uh, we have to uh, show that it makes sense uh, as a new therapeutic approach. And uh, when thinking about basically just uh, mentioning what Ug mentioned earlier, uh, saying that uh, developing a new chemical entity takes time, it takes also a lot of money uh, on average, you can consider that if you are developing a new chemical entity, it will take you uh, five years, maybe seven to 10 million euros uh, to get to go from uh, drug screening. So having a hit out of uh, your screening platform to first in man trial. So it's very expensive. Uh, it's lengthy in terms of process and it leads you only at a step where you can say, okay, now we will try and see if it does something in the patient. And since we are developing this, this very novel concept, uh, we wanted to find a way uh, that would be more time and cost effective in uh, allowing us to prove that the concept is right and makes sense, basically. So this is where we found uh, drug repurposing uh, to be a right way to meet our goals. And, uh, and again, going back to this matrix of cost and time, um, it took us, so Thernexus was created in 2013. And uh, by the time where uh, the company was listed on the stock exchange market in Paris, that was in, back in 2017, so four years after, at this time already, we had three drugs in the clinic. So only four years after, uh, and only by having spent uh, a bit less than 6 million euros. So if I may, uh, in a way, uh, summarize this, uh, with the same amount of time and money uh, than the one needed to have a hit develop to first in man application, we were uh, we succeeded to have three drug candidates with the same amount of time and money. So, uh, so for us, this is really one key aspect. 
uh, as well as, and certainly most important, that is that now we are in a position to prove that uh, these products uh, bring something to the patient, can bring a benefit, and that the overall mechanism of action makes sense uh, yeah. in terms of benefit to the patient. Yeah, indeed, indeed, Julia. But you also uh, are using a drug combination technology, uh, which is also, uh, I, I should say, a key element of Terranexus. Could you just uh, elaborate yeah. that very quickly? Yeah, yeah. So, as I mentioned, uh, our strategy and our general concept is to target both neuron and glial cells at the same time. And to do so, we are indeed using drug combinations with, on the one hand, a drug that will be uh, hitting a neuronal target, while, the, while on the other, we'll be having a drug hitting a glial target. And this is the synergy of the action of these two targets that uh, leads to what we hope will translate into a clinical benefit to the patient. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is also important to us. Uh, I mean, this combination strategy is first based on uh, a scientific concept and uh, the hope for a, a medical benefit. But it has also an advantage to us that is really important, but it allows us to get new IP as well. And so uh, this allows us to have strong patents that uh, are important, and we may discuss with this later on in, in, in this presentation, but that are important basically to build uh, a good business case that may help convince investors afterward. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. It's also, it was very important to, to mention it. Terence, what's your strategy? Thank you, Christine, and hello, everyone. Uh, just my professional story to explain why I, uh, I arrived in the field of drug repurposing. When I started my, my career, I wanted to make drug discovery. It was really something I wanted to do, but I wanted to do it faster than others and, and we know that it is a very long uh, way until um, the, the drug approval and even before the, the first in human uh, trial. So we try to turn the pharmacological activity of some drugs, existing drugs, by modifying them chemically uh, and to turn their, their specificity, their selectivity uh, to address another disease uh, targeting the same target family, in fact, of the first drug. As an example, we have worked on Tadalafil, which is uh, uh, a drug uh, addressing uh, erectile dysfunction, like Sildenafil, Vi Viagra. It's a, it's a competitor. So Tadalafil target the phosphodiesterase of type 5, the human one. And we know that some parasites, and particularly Plasmodium falciparum, have also some phosphodiesterase with the kind of similarities with PD-5. And modifying chemically Tadalafil, we try to lose the activity on the human target and gain activity on the Plasmodium falciparum target. And in fact, we managed to do it. In vitro, we managed to kill the parasite without touching to the human PD-5. So it was really a success. But when you modify the drug, in fact, you modify its pharmacological activity, but you modify everything, in fact. And we, when we tested our uh, drug-derived molecule, in an in vivo model, in mice, we have seen no activity at all. And we try to understand why. And in fact, we have modified a lot its uh, metabolic stability. The drug was not enough stable to go to the parasite and kill the parasite in vivo. So it was uh, disappointing, really. And we then decided to make repurposing our strategy. So we decided to assemble a drug collection. So we have identified 
thousands of different drugs from anywhere in the world. We make a database first, and then we try to collect the drug to be, to be able to test them in vitro. So we start by buying the collections available commercially, and then for the lacking drugs, we buy the drugs in the pharmacies, in the hospitals, and we isolated the API, the active pharmaceutical ingredients from, from the excipients to uh, feed our collection. And today with this strategy, we have more than 2,600 different molecules that have been approved for uh, use in human. Uh, this was the first decision. And the second one was uh, to screen systematically all the collection on in vitro models. So at that time, we, have, we, we should have been able to uh, design and develop screening assays really fast to make a lot of screening in different disease disorders. So we decided to directly use the cells coming from patients. So we, the easiest way to obtain cells from patients is blood and skin. Uh, we decided to use skin because you can isolate from skin biopsies of fibroblasts and you can work on fibroblasts because you can amplify um, a lot of these kind of, of cells. And most of the fibroblasts have the same, um, I mean, um, for a lot of metabolic disorders particularly, they have the defect that is responsible for the symptoms. Even if in the disease there is no skin affection, the fibroblast you can measure the defect in vitro. Um, but one of the limits of these strategies, combining uh, uh, screening of drugs directly on patient cells, is a success rate. When you do screening, you have maybe something like one person's success rate. So it means that you can find one hit testing 100 hits. So if you calculate for screening only 2,600 drugs, you have a lot of chance to not to identify anything, in fact. So the idea was to be able to screen a lot in different patients affected by different disorders. And we developed, we developed um, spec mass spectrometry technologies to be able to screen directly with a mass spectrometer. So today, with our machines, we can screen 2,600 uh, drugs in less than one day by mass spectrometry focusing on several biomarkers. So each time we identified a relevant biomarker in the disease, then we collect the cell from the patients. And in less, that, in less than a couple of months, we are able to screen all the drugs on the market directly for one patient. And, yeah. I, I still have many questions for all of you. <laughs> there was, just, just to say that, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's great to see that drug repurposing is not just a concept, but may have different practical approaches. You know, when listening to your uh, three different companies, your different, uh, uh, three different stories, you know, uh, strategies in drug repurposing may be very, very different from each other. You know, either developing drugs to address children and met needs with new formulations uh, adapted to the using children as uh, Ophelia is doing, or using a drug combination technology and innovative combinations leading to new strong patents as uh, Terranexus is doing, or as, 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 you, as you did, a little bit thinking uh, outside the box, I should say, uh, for, for Aptius, uh, based uh, on such an individualized, uh, individualized approach, you know, based on, on, on the patient's cells. I, I think that's, uh, that, that, that's very interesting to, to, to listen to you. And based on these different approaches, my, my second question would be, 
uh, to know more about the, the challenges, if any, <laughs> if any challenges you have encountered. Um, Hugues, what, what's your main challenge? Uh, there's plenty, actually. Uh, there's not a single one. Uh, as ever in drug development, you know, it's not uh, an easy task, but anyway. Uh, I, I would probably stress the, probably the most acute problem that we have met is, uh, at least for us, is market access. Is a uh, the step that we have when you really want to negotiate prices with the HTA bodies and you really want to have a reasonable price because you're addressing a population which is small, you have a product which is based on something which does exist already and is usually priced very low. And so you will have to negotiate somehow a premium price, which is um, a rude word in some uh, uh, in some bodies. <laughs> so uh, this is this is mainly the uh, the, the the main. Uh, this, this is actually something which is uh, a real hurdle in the development of uh, repurposed medicines, uh, especially because, as uh, the previous speaker said, uh, the uh, pricing and reimbursement functions are uh, local. Each country has its own uh, set of regulation and of pricing policies. Uh, and you really need to, if you want to launch your product in various countries, you really need to have an in-depth knowledge of the local regulations. And believe me, uh, you have very, uh, very, there is many subtleties that if you don't, that you may not know. For instance, we are a French company. Uh, we have launched uh, Kigebec in Germany and the UK, not, not by ourselves actually, through distribution partners. But still, there is a lot of subtleties that you need to know if you want to uh, have a price, actually. And pricing of repurposed medicine is something which is a bit difficult in Europe uh, for the time being. I can give you an example of the product that we have launched, Kigebec. It's on, it's on the market. It have been uh, registered in 2019, end of 2018, actually. And it has been launched in Germany, France, and UK and it's being launched in other European countries at the time we speak. But in France and Germany, we obtained, we negotiated uh, prices directly uh, with CEPS, for instance, in France, and we had a price which is reasonable in France, I should say. And uh, even if CEPS is renowned for having a very tight, very tough position regarding prices, we finally obtained a price which we believe is acceptable, which is about four times the originator's molecule price, which is on the market for 30 years. And uh, it's based on some rationale that we have developed and they accepted it. In the UK, it's about five times the several price. Uh, but in Germany, uh, the GBA, the GBA uh, finally said, no, we will give you one third of the originator price, uh, one third. Of original price that have been on the market for 40, 30 years. So obviously that's well below the cost of good <laughs> that we can achieve. We had to withdraw and we withdraw the uh, get back from Germany. Uh, so just to highlight the fact that situation is extremely variable from one country to another one. Uh, Germany, which is a uh, country which is renowned for having uh, fair pricing policies have been in fact, I should say. <laughs> It's uh, for us, at least in Ophelia, that's, that's a real uh, heartbreaking, that's heartbreaking that we could not have achieved a reasonable price in Germany because we have to withdraw product. And in the end, that is a patient who do not, does not have access to the medicine. That's the way it is. And uh, in Germany, you don't have any uh, appeal system and so you, you can't get back. So once it's decided, it's decided forever. Okay. So thank you very much for your transparency, uh, Hugues. Uh, it's good to, to, to keep in mind that uh, the marketing authorization is given at a, a European level. But I, as you said, uh, pricing and re reimbursement have to be negotiated uh, country by country. No, locally, absolutely. Locally, locally. Yeah. yeah. And believe me, regulation are very different from one country to another. So you really need to be well counseled. You need to have someone local who knows the regulation when you want to launch in one country. That's, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah. The regulation, but also the pricing. Um, yes, pricing regulation. Pricing regulation, yeah. Um, um, Julien, did you encounter the same 
uh, market access challenges? So I would say not yet, but I would say in a different way. Um, basically, uh, drug repurposing, this is what we said earlier, allows you to go faster, to accelerate your development. Um, however, it is not an exemption uh, to the general rules on drug development. This is what was mentioned in the, in the first presentation of today. So that it means that you, you still have to prove your hypothesis is right. You still have to prove that you bring a benefit to the patient. And uh, you have to comply with everything that is needed, basically, to develop a drug uh, for a specific indication. And in our case, uh, one challenge that we are facing relating to that, and that is associated with our technology, is uh, that since we are developing combinations, we have to comply with regulation on drug combinations. And this means that we have to have uh, more complex clinical trials, having different arms with on top of the combination and placebo having arm of drug A, arm of drug B and so on. So it increased costs and uh, clinical trials are already very expensive. So you increase costs on something that is very expensive is becoming just super expensive. So bottom line of this is that you need to raise capital when you're a, a biotech company like us and you need to do it uh, from investors and to succeed, you have to uh, present them a, a, what they see as a compelling business case. So basically this is a case for any healthcare product. <laughs> I mean, you want to raise money, you have to explain your investors why they have to invest in your company. But when uh, you are presenting them with a project involving drug repurposing, they uh, systematically have two key questions. One that is, what is your level of exclusivity on the market? Basically, what protects your drug from being counterfeited or copied uh, because there is something else that is really similar to your drug that is already available. So it's what IP do you have or what level of exclusivity do you have? So it could be IP, ODD, uh, Puma, for example. So anything that can build up your exclusivity level will help in that sense. Uh, but also uh, beyond that uh, is the question about how do you differentiate from the originator drug? Uh, in other words, how or why couldn't a physician just prescribe the drug that is here available on the market for a few cents instead of prescribing your drug which, for which you want to have a premium price because you've made all this investment in clinical trials and so on and so forth. So this is generally one key question that we have to answer uh, on this. And, uh, and then, of course, as mentioned by you, it's a question about pricing. And again, it's going back to the same point. It's to say, okay, there is the same molecule that is available, maybe under another uh, formulation, but that's still available. And, uh, and with a price that is, generally speaking, very low. So in the end, it all turns around the same idea about how do you differentiate? How do you make your drug different from what is already on the market? What makes it exclusive? And what makes it have uh, a value that is different from the generic uh, av available on the market? And again, here, this is all about IP, but beyond just method of use patents, so having anything on formulation, on dosage, rational, on combination, whatever you can have that is just beyond just method of use, because method of use is very easy to bypass. Uh, any often status, uh, exclusivity status that may substitute or complement to the IP, and rely uh, regarding pricing, I think that it's really to be able to, and, and, and this is 
a key challenge. It's how are you able to prove the added value of your product to compare to not only what might be existing in the indication that you are targeting, but also versus you are creating in a way your own competitor because you have the same molecule already there. So you have to prove that what you are proposing the product is just better than the molecule as it is currently available. Uh, and, and this, uh, in my opinion, requires to be considered much early on in the development process compared to a, a new chemical entity. With a new chemical entity, you can think about it much later, but with drug repurposing, it's becoming central because you have to provide answers to these key questions from your investors. Otherwise, just don't get the money and you cannot develop your drug. Mm. I've got the feeling that uh, you, you, you have to start your drug development by starting with the market access, actually, uh, to, to, and to, to, to think of everything that has to be performed towards uh, uh, a good market access for your products and for patients. Uh, Terence, uh, I can feel that your challenges may be different. Yes, so you, you understood that uh, our position is earlier in the process uh, compared to Hugues and, and Julien. And you also understood that our tool we developed this uh, last year is perfectly adapted to ultra-orphan disease. When there is only one or two patients in France or even in Europe, because we can adapt uh, in this situation, address the medical, need, uh, the medical need of this person, of these patients. So my challenge today is the sustainability of what we are doing, in fact, because uh, we have succeeded in several projects, meaning that there is some children today taking a drug that we recommend for them because we have uh, demonstrated their uh, efficacy in vitro. Uh, but who is paying that service? Um, so we are still trying some business models and the current one is um, uh, a collaboration, a partnership with patient organizations who pay a part of the research we are doing for them. Um, so they are able to finance the early phases of the research process leading from scratch to the identification of a drug for one patient, but then we can't stop there and we must investigate if this drug is suitable for others, for other patients in the world. And at that time, we must demonstrate further the efficacy on more elaborated models, for example, in vivo models. And there is there that we have some, uh, some problems some financial problems because who will finance this research? Because in that situation, we are facing the same problems as, as Julien said just before, but in the field of ultra orphan disease. So we are combining the limits of drug repurposing and the limits of the very small population of ultra orphan disease. And this is really the tricky part. And my last word would be, don't forget that there is patience. We must think out of the box for, for those patients. It's really essential. Yeah, and your, your activities actually um, must impact your relationships with the patients themselves and all the parents of the patient mm -hmm. and even the clinicians. Uh, because you, you work on patient cells and you work with them. Exactly, yes, we, we have a, a direct uh, discussions with parents, with clinicians, and we try to find supports from everywhere, even researchers that, that have already worked on that disorders or a, a similar one. And, and together we manage to do it fast. So I think it's a key. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So if I'm right, um, I've got the feeling that your 
challenges are more downstream than upstream. Uh, you know, I thought that you would have talked more about IP challenges, which are often reported in the literature, actually. But your main challenges are more about market access, pricing, um, building a convincing company's uh, business case, as, as Julien says, or sustainability and economic viability. So the, 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 the last question uh, will be, how do you uh, address these challenges? Hugues, you wish for you. Start? Yeah. Okay. So how do we address the, fact, the pricing with the market, the market access challenges? I think as uh, uh, Julien pointed out, one, one important thing to, to do first upfront is a good business plan. It is a good business case. You have to understand what an indication in, what, in which you want to go, what the uh, incidence prevalence of the indication, which product you were purposing. Uh, so what, what is the price of the originator as molecule, for instance, or molecules with, a, with an S. Uh, and, and what, which kind of uh, clinical evidence that you will bring to, um, to prove your, uh, your superiority or your yeah. medical benefit anyway. But anyway, you, you need to, to build the business case uh, up front before moving into the, uh, the development itself. Uh, otherwise, it's something which uh, you can end up with, um, with trouble uh, in the end. Um, that's one point. Uh, I should also stress that uh, there is some, there is, well, if you can have an orphan designation, this is something which is usually very useful. But I suppose that in most cases, um, in repurposing, well, most of repurposed medicine do address uh, indication which can be, um, which can be, uh, which can end up in orphan designation. So, uh, but this is something which is important. I, even for market access, because some uh, HTA bodies do recognize an added value uh, to orphan medicine. And I thought also should stress that if you, that, that's very French, I should say, but if you go through the uh, ATU process, or uh, I, I, it's not more ATU, it has changed recently, now it's AAP, but, uh, uh, but if you go through this, you, you, you can still have also some potential benefit if you're, uh, if you're, um, developing repurposed medicine, um, because there is some uh, scheme in, in, under which you, you can still market your medicine, even if you don't address, if you don't agree with the price with the uh, HTA body, with the COPS, you can still market it uh, at your price you want. So there is subtleties in which you can still uh, find a way to, to market your product. And it, actually, it's a good way for prescribers to um, know about your product and to uh, prescribe it. And yes, it absolutely. It, it is, well, ATU and, uh, is a pre-marketing, I should say, pre-launching uh, process anyway. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, and then uh, obviously, uh, how do we address, I, I should, so one point that I have not discussed before, but uh, uh, when we build post medicine, usually we also look at uh, the formulation. It's something which is important because it is something that is, uh, we said, um, a bar barrier to the uh, to the potential entry or use by clinician of uh, uh, generics, I should say. But by the so, way, if I may interrupt you, um, do you consider preparations made by hospital pharmacists as a threat? Uh, I, in Europe, probably not too much, not too much, because once there is um, an authorized medicine, normally the the uh, the, uh, the, the, the hospital pharmacists uh, tend to um, drop their preparation. Uh, in the U.S., it's certainly more uh, of an issue because they have much more uh, uh, freedom to do what, what they want. <laughs> uh, so, uh, U.S. is another story, but in Europe. Probably once you have, uh, for, let, let, me, let me give you an, an example. Yes. We have a project which is called Chemozo, which is reformulation and repurposing actually of an anti-cancer medicine in your blastoma. The project comes from Gustave Roussy Hospital in, in south of Paris. Uh, 
and uh, we're developing it and we will be launching it and we have been evaluating whether the, uh, the current hospital preparation, because there is, at Gustav Roussy, for instance, and in some other places, uh, could be competitors and obviously they won't. Once we will have a product uh, launched, registered, reimbursed, uh, they will stop doing uh, the hospital preparation. Okay, okay, that's so, clear. That's mm. clear. That's normal, actually. Um, I think so. Yeah. Um, how did the others address their challenges? Yeah, uh, I, I think that um, with the purpose, uh, thinking about uh, this business case and pricing issue, uh, I think th the way we address it is really to try to have some kind of design thinking approach that is to uh, kind of well to say that we, we try to have uh, to understand the patient's need as much as we can. And we believe this is really the cornerstone uh, for, uh, for our, our, our approach. Um, I mean, for us, it's if you are able to best understand what's the patient burden, uh, what's the patient journey and the burden and how your technology uh, may uh, help alleviate this burden to the patient and, and their caregivers. This is certainly the way that you can first best design your type development process in order to get the right evidence that you indeed bring uh, a, a true benefit, I would say, uh, to the patient. Uh, and this is based on these evidences that afterwards, and having this understanding, that afterwards uh, you are able to best explain uh, to payers that to payers and thereby to investors as well, mm. uh, that what you are doing uh, makes sense on a clinical perspective, but also on an economic perspective. So, uh, so yeah, so for us, it's really about, again, understanding the patient journey, understanding the burden. If, if I may take an example, uh, one of, of our products, uh, THN 102, is a combination that we develop in an indication that is not rare, but that is excessive daytime sleepiness in Parkinson's disease. And we came to this indication because uh, when discussing with key opinion leaders, when having feedback from patients, we understood that while it's an often overlooked symptom currently, it's really impacting the everyday life of patients and their caregivers. It, it has really a strong impact on the, the life of the patients who are presenting with this symptom. So uh, this led us to uh, develop our combination in this indication where there is no treatment currently and every drug that were tested there fail actually to show a benefit. But on top of that, as we are progressing into this development and we continue to investigate about the need and understanding this symptom and how patients are suffering from that, we came to understand as well that uh, the patients who are presenting with this symptom are also uh, much more at risk of experience of choking, so of having swallowing difficulties. And it's now well documented in the literature as well, so that we are now on top of the combination, which has an, an advantage and a benefit on its own to the patient. We are now working on a convenient way to deliver these products to the patient, so that takes into account the specific need of these patients who have difficulties in swallowing drugs, basically, and having a formulation, uh, as mentioned by Hugues, that helps the patient basically uh, coping with this difficulty when swallowing the drug that will be providing them to, to treat their symptom. Okay, okay, very interesting. Terence, um, I, I would like to, to ask you the, the question you already mentioned, how do you finance your activities? Because that's the big challenge for you. Yes, it's a big challenge. So. I, I see one general answer and one particular one. The, the general one could be to uh, 
include in the drug, dis drug repurposing uh, discovery um, the way to use the what we call the sleeping beauties, the molecules that do not reach the market, but that was uh, studied in clinical trials and abandoned for um, efficacy reasons, not safety ones. And all these molecules are sleeping in uh, the big pharma uh, most often. Shelf molecules, and, as we say. Shelf yes. molecules, as we say. Exactly. Yeah. And, and a way to maybe make uh, more attractive our project for investors could be to repurpose such drug because for most of them, there is still some IP and they are not available already on the market. So this was a, a general remark. The particular one was concerning Apteus. What we did recently, uh, we, we share our technology with Institut Pasteur de Lille uh, during the COVID crisis and we screen our collection against SARS-CoV-2. And currently we are repurposing the clofoctol uh, to address COVID-19, uh, COVID sorry. Uh, and, and maybe this could be a way to finance the activity for individualized ultra rare patients. Actually a successful um, uh, orphan drug in an indication can allow you to uh, keep on working on the others. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure that you all call for better recognition of drug repurposing and maybe specific incentives. Uh, that actually um, would be would 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 be um, would be a good thing. So, Monsieur, the the time has come to to exchange now with the audience. Um, we already have um, some questions. The first one is how to convince investors to support your project. That's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> you must I, I think, I think Julie, Julien has some experience also. Can also answer. That's not easy. That's not easy to convince uh, investors or venture capital to... Uh, to be interested in your uh, in your uh, in your venture in your company, if you do repurposing, because it's usually not very well perceived, I should say. And usually, to be honest, also we do address small markets. Uh, I, I don't know for the Arnictus. I believe the Arnictus is, is address larger market than uh, what we do at Ophelia Pharma, but we do address niche markets in very severe type of indication, like uh, infotospasm, for instance. Uh, but it's quite difficult to uh, convince uh, venture capital. Uh, hopefully at Orphelia, we do have a very supportive shareholder, uh, the uh, 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 family office who supports us uh, from several years from now. And that's, that was absolutely key to success for Orphelia Pharma, I should say. Uh, without uh, Octalfa, the, um, the, 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 this, this shareholder, we would not be, we would not have done anything actually, I should say. Uh, and we've been through the, uh, all the venture capital in Paris and uh, knocking at doors and saying, oh, look, look, what we do is, is very great. You should be interested, but they were not much interested actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's not, that's not any, I don't have an answer for this question. Actually, this is very dependent on, upon who you meet, how you, you convince them of your, uh, of the interest of your uh, story and your projects. This is something difficult. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Generally speaking, uh, investors in life sciences are interested in two high risk, high reward projects. Mm. So when you present them with drug repurposing, they consider, okay, this is lower risk, but certainly low reward as well. And this is not just matching their expectation. So uh, the way you can, uh, I would say ideal way <laughs> you can do to overcome this issue and it's not easy to do basically is again uh, being able to show them that it's low risk but it's high reward as well and in this case then you get an advantage into your discussion of other projects because you have this right balance between the reward and the lower risk 
uh, with repurposing. Um, th th thank you. Uh, I, I try to, to look at the question and answer uh, that have not been answered, but maybe for, for all the others, uh, Hugues, uh, mm -hmm. another question that I think you already answered in the, in the, in the, in the chat, but maybe for, for the others. Um, Yes, for those of you that have submitted a marketing authorization application, did you have access to the original data sets around safety and tox? And if so, how did you get this? If not, why not? And did you have to repeat the preclinical GLP studies? No, hopefully not. <laughs> hopefully not. Usually you, you, you rely on an existing molecule which has done its preclinical studies and so in your dossier, you will sim simply put the, the main results that, that are usually published. So you will rely on, a, on, a, on, a, on a, existing publications uh, in your dossier and uh, you will cross-link them usually because in your uh, application, you will use an hybrid medicine status. Uh, that's, that's something which is, uh, I've not been discussed before, I believe, but the 10.3 status uh, of uh, Hybrid medicine actually is, is very often used in, in repurposing of, of non-medicine because it, the hybrid medicine is a medicine which relies on existing data set, but which depart from an existing drug by either the indication, the formulation, the strengths, uh, usually it's, it's uh, the, the three points that are. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And another question for you, Hugues, uh, from Cibren, what, what's the rationale you used to determine the price at four or five uh, times the price of the um, oh. original? Frankly? Well, that's, that's, uh, that's a story of, of Kikibek. We, we demonstrated, we simply said, we demonstrated actually that there was no differences in price on, on, on the price for the daily treatment cost. So we said to the, uh, to the payers that the daily treatment cost for a child, for, for an infant, actually should not be over, is not over that of an adult. But obviously since the drug is not dosed the same way in a very young child, which weigh five kilograms and an adult which weigh 60 kilograms or 70 kilograms, you have a difference in, in, in the pricing of the drug per milligram. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the way we, we, we finally convince them, simply by saying, this will not be more expensive than treating an adult, treating a child. And it does make sense, actually. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the, the question from Peter Bram, uh, which is uh, more or less on the same line, what determines a reasonable price for a repurposed drug? Uh, I can answer that also, but this is difficult. <laughs> <laughs> this <question>. is difficult. <laughs> it is not uh, only the improvement of the medical benefits? Absolutely. That's one point. Major point. Yes, major point. I agree with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, another question also for, for you, uh, Hugues, from Maja. Um, in your opinion, why did Puma had limited success? Um, uh, for sure, it was not used along uh, many times, uh, this uh, regulatory tool. Um, what do you think of this, uh, of this, uh, of this tool? Ah, that, that was a good incentive from the uh, EMA, uh, good initiative actually from the EMA uh, trying to promote uh, pediatric medicines from existing uh, off-label, off-patent um, off uh, medicine. Yeah. But there is not so many, uh, so many drugs developed this way simply, I believe because uh, it's not very rewarding. There is not much reward. Yeah. From this type of development and actually even a puma can be deleterious. Uh, I have the example with Kigebek which is a puma actually. It's the fourth or fifth puma, I don't remember exactly but it, it is a puma and in Germany being a puma is deleterious. Uh, that's the way it is because uh, the, uh, the GBA will say if you're a puma you have to file a full dossier which is several hundred pages which is not doable and uh, that, that's the way uh, that's the way uh, well, so it's, it's not always very useful. For the, for, for the drug that we're developing now, right now, which are in the clinical development now, uh, we will 
probably don't use the Puma status. It will be orphan medicine, all of them, orphan medicine, that's for sure, but Puma, probably not. And we will probably give up the two additional years of protection of the Puma. Yeah, maybe you, you, you could um, um, explain what, what the Puma is for those who don't know what it is. It's a specific type of uh, marketing authorization uh, called uh, pediatric use marketing authorization, Puma. Uh, which have been uh, initiated by the EMA probably about hmm, when 10 years ago, something like that. Maybe I'm not good. Confirm it. 10 years ago, and yeah. the uh, the idea was if that if you uh, develop a medicine from an existing medicine which is off patent, so you start from something which is off patent, a generic type medicine, and that you develop something new, a formulation, for instance, which is different from the originator because there is a clinical need or a new indication because that's an indication in which there is real use of this medicine, you can apply for a Puma. And the Puma will give you uh, some benefit in terms of market protection. Uh, that's uh, uh, actually a data protection. That's not exactly the same level of protection as often medicine, it's a data protection. Whereas often medicine is a market exclusivity, which is a slightly different, and that's for 10 years. Okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hugues. Um, now a question to Terence from Roberto. Can you provide an example of a patient cell phenotype biomarker that you use as a readout for repurposed drug screening? Yes, sure. We, we have a good expertise in the uh, lipids biomarkers and specifically the sphingolipids and for example when you look at uh, the, the disease which is called Farber disease or uh, uh, it is a deficiency of acid ceramidase so the enzyme within the lysosomes who degrade the ceramides in fact the ceramides accumulate in the cells and this is a specific biomarker for diagnostic and we are uh, following these biomarkers in vitro but also in vivo and there is three child today who are, who are receiving a, a, a drug combination that decreases the ceramide accumulation in vitro. And we are, uh, hope, we, we, hopefully we, we will measure the decrease of the ceramides in vivo also. Okay, thank you. Uh, a question from Sibran. Ah, oh, that's for me. Where does the number of 45 repurposed offer drugs come from? Good question, Sibran. Actually, uh, EMA doesn't make systematically uh, any, any, any statistics, but um, I, I will write the, 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 the link uh, because it was a quote from the EMA uh, based on a specific uh, paper who uh, didn't uh, say exactly uh, there are 45 repurposed often drugs, uh, but uh, one in five, one in five. So it means 20, 20%, 20, uh, 20, 25 percent of orphan drugs are repurposed drugs um, in, in Europe. And that's the same also in the States. The, the, the statistics are more clear and uh, for sure there are 25 percent also of repurposed uh, orphan drugs um, um, in, in the States. Um, now, um, maybe a more uh, practical question. Uh, to all of you, um, regarding the launch of your drugs, how long did it take from development to patient? Still some time, still some time. It's not, uh, it's not because it's uh, shorter or quicker than uh, a conventional drug development process. It still took, I would say five, five, six years from start of the project to first patient treated, well, the product in the market and patient treated. Okay, okay, but five to six years is not so... Well, of course, it's, it's very dependent upon uh, what you're doing in the clinics, of course. Yeah. If you're doing a phase two, three pivotal trial with efficacy safety data, that takes always long because you address often indications, it can be 10 years. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we say um, one of the key advantages of drug repurposing is shorter timelines, but of course, it depends, in depends yes. as you say. I agree. Just, just for the uh, marketing authorization itself, it's usually above one year. So you have, yeah. well, even if the EMA claims it's 210 days, it's uh, usually they have clock stop. So the clock stop, they answer, ask question always. So you have to answer that as a question and so on. Yeah. So it takes time and it usually takes 
12, 18 months, and then you have to go through the uh, HIS, the, uh, the uh, HIS, and then the CPS, and that's another year. Yes, so you, yes. you see the time that you will spend into non-development activities, yes. uh, registration, and then uh, market with, access. With the payers. Mm. Um, um, Julien, do, do you want also to answer that question? Yeah, well, basically, uh, again, uh, track repurposing, as, as mentioned by Hugues, it allows you to get faster, especially in the earlier phase of the development. But when it comes to uh, the later stage, so phase two and beyond, you still have to comply with uh, the usual development process. And there it's all dependent on your indication. I mean, for example, uh, we are now working on a project in, in a rare lysosomal storage disorder, juvenile baton disease, and we are now planning for a pivotal phase two, three trial. But since it's a degenerative process, uh, you have to treat patient for two years in order to, to show something. So you are anyway dependent upon uh, mm. the time you need to see uh, an event or a benefit uh, in the patient in clinical trials. And, and this is not shortened because you are doing tricky purposing. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think there are stereotypes sometimes that have to be modulated. So mm. that's, um, that's the end of uh, our round table. Uh, thank you very much to our three speakers for their transversal regards, their transparency, uh, and for, for sharing their, their experience and, and opportunities you know, in drug repurposing, which I have to say is a really promising field for patients with uh, rare diseases. Thank you very much to, um, to the organizer and thank you very much to all participants for listening and for their uh, participation. Greatly appreciated. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Have a nice thank day. You, everyone. Thank you all. Thanks a lot. Um, so I, I thank you again, uh, Professor Cano. I, I would like to thank all the speakers who actually talked uh, today and shared their, their views and their uh, experiences with us today, giving really a, a really practical view of, uh, of what it means to actually develop a, a drug uh, that is repurposed and actually to also bring it to the market. Um, so I would like again to thank you all. Thank you. Uh, also to our audience for the really uh, nice questions that they have provided and that have, have helped uh, really making a very interesting discussion. I'd like to thank Christine for uh, wonderfully leading the, and moderating the, the round table. And uh, before I say goodbye to everyone, just a quick um, reminder that uh, you have a link to the recording of this session uh, that has been posted on the chat and uh, you should briefly receive uh, the link uh, as well uh, since you registered for uh, the event. So again, thank you all for being here today and uh, I hope you all enjoyed as much as we did the, um, the wonderful um, speak, the speeches from our uh, speakers. Thank you very much again, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.